Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Big Ecology Draw Along. This is all very exciting. My name is Sophie Pavel. I'm a zoologist and science communicator, and I'm streaming to you live from a very rainy Devon. But don't worry, this is perfect weather to do some drawing, so I think we're going to have a lot of fun. We've got some amazing ecologists and artists lined up, ready to take you through a step-by-step -step tutorial about three amazing species that we have here on our British doorsteps. So all you need is very simple equipment just need here we go a bit of paper a pen maybe some colors even better if you've got some colors but don't worry we've got plenty of time to polish our drawings throughout the rest of the day and the event as well um one thing to note this is art so be open to interpretation don't stress about your drawings there's no points for the best drawing um there's no need to feel bad if you're not very happy with your drawing at the time it's all a bit fun and we're going to learn some incredible facts about these species which i'm really excited about i am no artist i did art a bit at school i've made christmas cards every year for the last year and they've sort of slowly decreased in quality but art is very fun and it's very individual and personal to use so hopefully you'll have a really good time in this next hour don't forget to share your drawings with us on Twitter and Instagram. Use the hashtag DrawAlongBES and Edinburgh Science Fest Festival as well, which this event is part of. It's been an amazing week of science and art and creativity. So we hope that you've been following along some of those events as well. Do let us know where you're joining from today. I think there's a lot of people joining from all different parts of the country. Um, there's a live chat box below. You'll see some things up there reminding you of the different hashtags and things to tag um, as you post your drawings. We'd love to see what you come up with. I think there's going to be an amazing array of different interpretations of the species today. Um, so yeah, let us know where you are in the chat box and we will get started. So I'm very excited to introduce our first ecologist of the day. Oh, hang on a sec. We've got someone from India. I think that's amazing. I think that's probably, I don't know, maybe that's the furthest person that we've got. Hello from London, Claire Asher. Thank you very much for coming. Rachel from Prime Art, joining from sunny Rumcorn in Merseyside. Very, very nice. Oh, Indonesia. Wow, what an international event. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Singapore. Okay, well, we've got an international <laughs> array of artists joining us today. So I'm going to introduce our first ecologist. Now, this guy is pretty cool. He's called Leif for Sweden. And uh, you'll normally see him crouching on the ground with his bum up in the air, looking at some rare orchid or something. He loves plants. He's from rural Wiltshire, and he's on a mission to get people excited about plants. And he recently finished his PhD at Kew Gardens studying orchids in the UK and published his first book, The Orchid Hunter, in 2017. So Leif, incoming. Hello. Hi, How are you, you doing? Good. I'm very well. I'm very excited to do some drawing. I haven't done any art since I was at school, I don't think. Okay. okay. I'm never very good at it, but I always really, really enjoyed it. So. Good. Well, that's a good canvas to start from as it were. Um, so how did art go for you at school then? What kind of things did you enjoy drawing? Um, I, I did, I like, I really like colour. Um, I've actually got, yeah. today, I've got about six colouring pencils. Oh, get <laughs> you. Out of my box somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm really, really a fan of the colouring things. So whenever they asked us to draw in like, you know, pencil or charcoal, yeah. that was always just, you know, I wasn't good enough. I had to I had to add the paints and things, but I usually ended yeah. up with paint all over the classroom. But uh, yeah, rather <laughs> than <laughs> <laughs> my bit of paper. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. And so um, it is, of course, July in the UK, and uh, there are some very colourful flowers out at the moment. But what's your favourite flowering at the moment? Favourite thing flowering at the moment. Um, I tell you what I found the other day, which was just incredible. Uh, it was a really, really tall plant called a melancholy thistle. Uh, Ooh, it's about good um, name. a metre tall. It's got these great big um, sort of flowering heads, which look like button mushrooms. But instead of your, you know, your mushroom sort of pale white colour on the top, it's this great big explosion of like really rich purple flowers. Mm. And it was just covered in insects. It was really, really cool. Uh, it used to be used to treat depression, which is why it's called melancholy thistle. Oh. Uh, great big chunky, uh, chunky plant. But yeah, really, really cool. So that, that's one to look out for if you're in the north of England. <laughs> nice. And what first got you interested in ecology and plants specifically then? Um, well, to be honest, <laughs> when I first, um, so my dad's really interested in birds and beetles. 
So he got me started uh, on nature. We used to go bird watching and we used to um, take a little net out into the field behind our house and sweep it through the grass, collect a load of insects uh, and identify them. But the plants, um, I became interested in plants because they didn't run away from me when I tried to have them. <laughs> I, you know, I spent my entire childhood running around the countryside, desperately trying to give appreciation to these birds, butterflies, but they always flew away. And they always ran away. <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> so, you feel yeah. Re multiple rejections. Yeah. <laughs> but the plants can do that. So uh, yeah, they were forced to sort of sit there while, <laughs> while I looked at yeah. them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we've got an exciting thing um, to draw today. And perhaps before we introduce our artist, Alicia, and the tutorial, let's have a little look at the bee orchid and see what we're going to be drawing now. I mean, that looks quite complicated. <laughs> <not gonna lie. laughs> uh, it's very it beautiful, really though. <laughs> it is, it is. So this is about um, generally about 15, 20 centimetres tall. Okay. Uh, some of them get really, really big and we'll have sort of six, seven, eight, nine flowers uh, going up that stem. Mm -hmm. But the end of the they just look so happy. They just look <laughs> really... You can see them smiling. Yeah. What, yeah. What, time of, what time of year do they start flowering then? They start flowering generally at the end of May and they'll last through June. Um, okay. So yeah, if you're going to look for them in the UK, then June is, is, is definitely the time. They grow all over the country. Uh, all over England, particularly in Wales. Uh, they're now creeping up into Scotland as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you can find in places like India and Indonesia, but I might be wrong. <laughs> um, Maybe but yeah, they're visit. a really, really cool plant. And I love that in, you know, Britain, cold, rainy, grey Britain, uh, you've still got wild orchids growing in the countryside. Or not in, and in yeah. Sydney, so yeah. <gasps> Oh my gosh. That is another orchid we get wild here in, in Britain. It's called the Lady Slipper. And as you may well agree, that's that looks like it's come straight out of the rainforest. Um, it really does. I saw a photo of this plant, I yeah. thought there's absolutely no way that grows. Okay, well, bee orchid, I am changing my paper to be portrait orientation, as I believe yeah. that's probably more suitable to a big plant. Um, before we before we have the tutorial, a little bit about our artist Alicia Hayden. Now she's a young, award-winning, a wildlife photographer, artist, writer, and filmmaker from North Yorkshire, and she's cu currently studying biological sciences at Oxford University. Uh, she started wildlife photography when she was just ten years old and hasn't been able to stop since. And she has a particular passion for birds and invertebrates in the UK countryside. And her debut illustrated poetry book, Rain Before Rainbows, is out now. So make sure you look out for that. Um, so we're going to cut to Alicia's tutorial in just a second. If you miss any of the steps, don't worry because we will have the step-by-step -step tutorial images flashing up um, a little bit after the video. So there's lots of opportunities to tweak and polish your drawings afterwards. So, Alicia, take it away. Hi, so I'm going to be drawing a bee orchid as part of the BES's digital draw along for the Edinburgh Science Festival. Um, and so, firstly, um, you can use any pen you want, but I'm going to be using a brush pen, a bit like this one here. Um, I really like this pen because it's got a thick nib and um, it means it's really fun to draw in, but you can use any pen or pencil that you want. Um, and I'm going to try and break it down to sort of easy to understand steps um, with some shapes and things to sort of help you do it. So I hope you enjoy it. So firstly, we'll get started. So we're going to draw a stem. So it wants to be a sort of long straight line, um, a bit like this. And then you want to draw the um, bud of the uh, bee orchid. Uh, so it wants to be a bit like a kidney bean like shape. So you're going to draw it like this. Next we're going to draw the petals. The orchids have four petals um, and two are particularly big so we'll do the, draw those ones first. They want to look a bit like rounded triangles so and then the next two are much smaller and come up from the top. So those are the four petals. Um, next we're going to do the little swirly things which are the pollen sacs coming out from the top of the flower and then the markings of the bee orchid on this main bean part bit here. So these two pollen sacs come up like this and then the markings are the shape of a sort of heart in the middle 
and then an oval on the side and then a wiggle at the bottom <laughs> with a couple of circles in it and then another oval on the other side. Um, next, the top of the bee, bee orchid has some leaves and some buds, so we're going to draw those. So the leaves are more kind of rounded triangles again. So these are the leaves. Next, we want to draw the buds. The buds are kind of like pointed ovals. So these are the buds here. And I'm going to draw one more bud at the top and maybe add a leaf just going like that. But you can add as many as you want, I've just chosen three. Um, then we're going to add some uh, leaves further down the stem. And these are just, again, sort of pointed triangles, I guess. So here's one. And here's another. And here's another. <laughs> okay, um, brilliant. I mean, this is more or less your bee orchid. And then you can colour it in however you like, really. So um, I coloured mine in as a sort of purple, <laughs> with, with a with a typical colour colours of a bee orchid. So purple, yellow, and green. And I'll pop a photo here. <laughs> um, I really hope you enjoyed drawing this bee orchid, and um, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the festival. Whoa, um, <laughs> wow, what well, should we do it on three? Ready? Yeah, Hold okay. up each other's ready. <laughs> One, two, three. I don't know if you've ever seen mine. Oh, oh no. not too bad. <laughs> so, what they do look very similar, they do they actually, both, don't they? We've both, yeah. done I felt like this bit looked oh, there it is. I thought that looked a bit like an asparagus. It does kind of look like an asparagus. Are they in any way related? <laughs> They are, yeah, yeah. Are they? Are they actually? Um, yeah, orchids um, are very closely related to sort of the asparagus uh, group. Uh, the ribbon oh. of the life. So yeah, you've done you've done very well there. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, so here we've got some step by steps, and one of my first um, thoughts was is that the stem is quite long, and then all of the important parts of the flower are sort of concentrated at the top, which I know is quite common, but it's it's very sort of ornate, isn't it? Mm. How is how are, how is the bee orchid especially adapted to pollination? I know there's a sort of a dead giveaway in the name, but can you yeah. go through the exact evolution that makes this plant so unique? Yeah, there's a very cool story, and I, I will preface this story by, by telling you that it's only partly true. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that a spoiler. Okay, so this orchid, the orchid and its close relatives, have evolved to exploit the sexual desire of male bees, and so, which in itself is just completely bonkers. Mm. Uh, what they do is basically the, the bees emerge, the male bees emerge in the spring a few weeks or a few days before the females do. So there's this period of time where there are male bees flying around but no females. Now the orchids have sort of timed over, over their evolution, they've timed their flowering period to coincide with that period of time where there are male bees flying around but no females. Mm -hmm. Now, the male bee, the flower of the bee orchid, looks, smells, and feels like a female bee of its species. If, how does it feel like a bee? Well, yeah, well, yeah. If you um, is it furry? I don't know if we. Yeah, so if you, I don't know if we've got a uh, another photo of one. But on the on the sort of haunches on the sides of that uh, bee-like petal, um, there oh, we go. There we go. Look. Oh wow! You've got these nice sort of long hairs on the sides, mm -hmm. which um, are kind of like the the legs on the side of the bee, mm -hmm. and then that mm -hmm. back bit is kind of a velvety texture. Uh, and as you can see, you know, to us it kind of looks like a bee. Um, maybe we're slightly more intelligent than a <laughs> than, a, than an actual bee. But to mm -hmm. the bee, the male bee, that looks, smells, and feels uh, like a female bee. And so our male mm -hmm. bee is all around. Uh, he's just emerged in the spring. He's searching for a female to mate with, pass on his genes to the next generation, and he comes across a bee orchid, and he sees. Uh, what he perceives to be a female resting on the flower with her head uh, buried amongst the petals. 
and he thinks, great, this is my lucky day, <laughs> I've scored. Uh, and he flies down, he lands on uh, the bee orchid flower and still completely convinced that this is a female, uh, he attempts to mate with the flower. Oh. Now the bee orchid, uh, while this is while this is happening, um, <laughs> so it's, got, it's got these two pollen sacs which we drew uh, at the top of the flower. Oh yes, um, is that? Those, hang on, is that yeah, yeah, these? Yeah. Uh, oh, where's the camera? Those two little things yeah, there. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those they kind of look like oh, little. Um, um, yes. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that. Okay, yeah. got it. Pollen sacs. I might annotate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually really good idea. Um, so they have these two little, uh, they kind of look like little microphones. They've got um, a big sort of block yeah. stick. And they uh, drop down and they mm. stick those pollen sacs onto the back of the bee's neck. The bee is completely oblivious to this, has no idea what's going on. He found a great pine, a little cloud pine. Um, and it doesn't harm the bee in any way. They just sort of attach to the back of its neck. Mm -hmm. Now, then, so the bee eventually, you know, starts getting a bit frustrated by the lack of action uh, and buzzes off in search for a more enthusiastic partner. And so our bee, male bee is flying around again. He comes across um, a new different population of bee orchids, immediately falls for the ruse all over again. And mm -hmm. in trying to mate with this next flower, then pollinates the orchid uh, with the pollen that's on the back of its neck. It's really, really clever, completely ingenious system. Uh, and what I love most about it is that this entire fraud is masterminded by a plant. And mm. it's really great when the plants get one over on the animals. Um, oh, so yeah. clever, isn't it? Really cool story. Um, Leif, we've got a question from Guernsey Biological Records Centre who have asked, if the bee orchids are very small, so about 10, 15 centimetres, does that mean that it's in a marginal environment? A marginal environment. Um, I mean, they grow they grow in lots of different places. One of the commonest places to find them is uh, in urban environments, surprisingly. Hmm. They love growing along uh, road verges. They love growing on roundabouts and things. So often where you get those uh, new roads and things put in, that disturbance in the ground, um, you know, sort of triggers flowering of bee orchids. Uh, I found one outside Burger King the other day. Uh, <laughs> I think I saw that on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't Burger King reply? They did. They did. Yeah. They were like, Excellent. oh, that's a really beautiful flower. Um, they can retweet it to their two million followers. Oh, you know. We can only hope. We can only hope. <laughs> and yeah. so was that the last time you saw one in um, life? No, I saw one in Surrey uh, a few days ago. But they're right okay. at the end of their flowering period now. So, yeah. yeah, there are a few still just about in flower, but they've mm -hmm. largely um, pollinated. The, so the reason that story I told you is slightly not true um, was oh, yeah. <laughs> just to clarify, is that, that they've evolved this system, uh, this incredible mechanism. But actually, the individual bee species that uh, has sort of co-evolved with the bee orchid has either died out or perhaps moved on to an orchid species. And so basically because they because it's disappeared in some respects, um, the bee orchid has actually had to make this drastic lifestyle change. And so now instead of being pollinated by the bees, uh, they actually have to pollinate themselves. And so while they've clearly evolved, oh. which the other closely related species still employ, uh, oh. they actually pollinate themselves. And so, yeah. So actually those those two uh, pollen sacs, instead of dropping down and just onto the bee's neck, mm. they've got a little structure which stops them pollinating themselves. And so it just drops down uh, and they, yeah, pollinate. pollinate so, uh, so what about, um, are, they, are any bees attracted to them as a nectar source or? There's no nectar whatsoever. There's uh, no nectar? Oh, they've wow. Got nectar. Um, the only scent they produce uh, mimic the pheromones produced by the female bee. So yeah. at evolutionary time, um, they've matched up, it's just so incredible. They've matched up <laughs> the same chemical compounds uh, that they release as scent in their flower. As, and they're the same as the chemical compounds released by the female of this wow. bee species. So yeah, and you know, that's, that's in the order of 100, 200 chemicals. So yeah. It's just 
that that's... Yeah. So is it fair to say then that if you were trying to persuade anyone to be a little bit interested in botany and flowers, the bee orchid is a pretty good place to start? It's a really good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, they're so charismatic. Uh, they're so beautiful to look at. They're so friendly. As I said earlier, they're very happy. <laughs> Um, very polite <laughs> you can't smile when you look at them so uh, yeah that's very but, true well i'm looking forward to coloring in my orchid i've added some yeah me too labels and things a little bit of grass on the bottom well i might draw burger king in the background actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, oh Leif, thank you so much that was fascinating and well, um you can follow Leif's adventures on twitter and instagram and see what he's up to looking for plants and getting us excited about them but um for now i think it's time to say bye-bye to Leif and introduce our second ecologist thank you so much thank you very much have a lovely day happy plant hunting <laughs> okay so we have our second ecologist to introduce to you uh this afternoon or this morning i still think it is <laughs> now isla hodgson is a very cool lady she's a scientist a wildlife guide, a scuba diver, and general all-round ocean enthusiast. She's originally from Newcastle, and then she moved to Aberdeen to study marine science in 2010, and she's specialising in marine mammal behaviour and habitat use. For her PhD, she then looked at conservation conflict management, and now works as a re research scientist in environmental governance, sustainable development, and conservation conflict management quite the CV. <laughs> she keeps connected to the marine world through scuba diving, citizen science projects, and as a guide for Basking Shark Scotland on the West Coast. And if you follow her on Twitter or social media, you will definitely get your shark fix. It's so, so cool. So Isla, welcome to the draw along. Lovely Hi. to see you. How are you doing? Good, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, it's lovely to have you. Now, what do you think of mine and Leif's attempt at a bee orchid? Oh, they were fabulous. I mean, I had a go as well. Um, oh, so did you? Let's what, have a look. This is what mine looks like. Oh. I added a oh, bee. Oh, very good. Oh, you've added but, a bee. Um, yeah. Very yeah, nice. What, what beautiful flowers. They're amazing. I know. Amazing, amazing little things. Now, how are you and Art generally? Are you good friends? Hang out with each other a lot? We, we're acquaintances. Um, so I did dabble <laughs> in art <laughs> at high school. So I did do, I shouldn't say this, I did do A-level art in high school. Um, oh, but I would, I would like to point out, out. yeah, <laughs> no, but I would like to point out that my yeah. art usually took months to produce. So I, I did lots of like intertailed things in black and white pencil. Um, um, and I did not do them in three minutes. This might be this might be quite interesting. And today I'm working with a sharpie, so I can't really make any. Yeah, mistakes. that looks good. It reminds me of um, Art Attack when I used to watch Art Attack on TV, and I always loved how they drew in black marker, and it just made it look so easy. But it is, um, yeah, you've got to be quite yeah, confident. Much, much, much. Yes, exactly. Although at the moment, <laughs> I kind of wish I was on Blue Peter. So this one I made earlier, and there's a beautiful. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Now, what's your favourite part of working in ecology? Your your experience is so broad, but it's the marine stuff that I think captivates a lot of people. What's your favourite part about that sort of stuff? Yes, exactly. So um, my favourite thing about, about ecology is that it doesn't just look at one thing. So it looks at, it looks at everything right from the, the tiniest little plankton right up to the, the massive animals like skin sharks and tries to understand how all these things are interlinked and in the ocean we we really don't know much, that much at all so we've actually explored mm -hmm. the surface of mars more than we have explored the deepest parts of the ocean so wow. there is so much still yeah yeah, yeah. so there's yeah. Really weird and wonderful in the ocean. and how long have you been the, um working with you know basking sharks in particular perhaps describe what um it was like when you first saw one because i think they're overlooked so much as you were saying so it must have been an incredible experience. Yeah, exactly. So I first started, I mean, I've, I've lived next to the sea my entire life, um, but I only really started working with sharks about three years ago. So I was kind of in a little bit of a gap in between my kind of academic career. Um, and I was looking for something that was a bit more hands on and just sort of like more being in the ocean every day. And luckily a job came up with Baskin Shark Scotland. So I went off to be a wildlife guide with them. Um, and I think a lot of people don't actually realise that in UK seas we have lots of species of shark. Um, in fact, we have mm -hmm. the Baskin shark, the second largest species of shark in the world, 
and around the coast of the western coast of Scotland it's one of the hot spots to see them in the entire world so it's absolutely mind-blowing um, but the first time I actually saw a basking shark um, I was guiding people in water um, and I had to pretend that I had seen them every single day and this was a completely <laughs> usual thing and yeah, so I had to, yeah, yeah and <laughs> they're amazing so we'll talk a little bit about this later on but they feed mm -hmm. on a really, really tiny little microscopic animal called zoopon um, and often that makes the water very cloudy and very murky because you get lots and lots of them all in one area um, and so mm -hmm. you don't see the baskin shark until it is literally right in front of you and it has its mouth wide open um, oh and you can goodness. see it come through the gloom yeah so um, typically what happens is we're on the surface and you're watching this you know, big one meter dorsal fin. So the big pointy coming straight towards you. Um, and then just at the last minute, I tell people to put their heads under the water and it's just there coming right towards you. It's it's pretty spectacular. Oh, that's amazing. Well, how about, before we go into the tutorial with Lauren, how about we just have a quick look at a basking mm -hmm. shark and remind ourselves of what it is we're gonna be drawing. Look at it, they're so cute. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I can see what you're saying about the murkiness because almost the latter half of its body is completely shrouded in in plankton and things like that. Oh, it's amazing. Yes. They look so ancient, don't they? So prehistoric. They do. they do, yeah. So actually, sharks in general are pretty prehistoric creatures. They're, they're such a mm. successful animal that they've been around for way longer than we have. You know, you talk of millions and millions and millions of years. And mm. the bass, you're right, they do look pretty prehistoric and, and, and a bit not like they've been around for yeah a long. been through the wars for sure well um <laughs> let's get to it then so our next artist is lauren cook and she is a phd student at the natural history museum in london and she's studying molecular ecology and alongside her studies lawrence is a, uh, lauren is a freelance artist and combines her interests in art and nature through science communication and she specializes in stop motion animation to raise conservation awareness and i don't know if you've seen any of her work, but it's absolutely amazing. So she's done some amazing um, ones looking at how beavers build their dams and create wetlands, and then also another one for Hen Harrier Day. Um, so definitely check out Laura's work. It's really, really cool. Um, and let's get our pens and papers at the ready. I think we're gonna go for a landscape one this time and um, see what Lauren's got in store for us. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren. I'm gonna teach you how to draw a basking shark. So all you need is a pencil and a rubber. And let's begin. So first, let's draw a big square. It's all gonna become clear. Then an oval, then a triangle on the top of the square, a big oval here, another one along this diagonal line, and an arc that sweeps through the oval. Then all we have to do is add an outline. So just go over this, all, all these shapes, join them all up in a nice smooth line. And that is our basic shark. Now we're going to add the tail and the fins. So these are just triangles. Two little ones here, big one here. Then big pectoral fins and one poking through at the back. Now what you want to do is just rub out some of these lines. Okay, once you've rubbed out all of the lines in the middle, we're just going to add in this big signature mouth here. So just draw a big arc. And then going round, and it just kind of comes in a bit here where the jaw is. Then this got kind of like chubby cheeks, so put those in there. Very important, add in the gills. We've got five, actually that should go up a bit more. Five lines for the gills. Then let's just smooth out some of these fins because they're kind of a bit more curvy. This signature shark fin that we all know, it's got a bit of a line in there. Same thing with the tail. Okay, 
and then we've got nostrils and an eye which is kind of right down here at the bottom just make sure you leave a little bit of light in the eye because that makes it look a bit more real then we're just going to add these kind of like peanut shapes um, I don't know what these are so hopefully Isla is going to tell us and there you are there is Mr Basking Shark and there you go so we can add more detail and colour these in in our own time but I make that about three minutes <laughs> well done looking forward to seeing your drawings Oh, <laughs> I was like furiously rubbing out the lines. Um, right, shall we do a reveal on three? Yes, I will preface this by saying that the sharpie was a big mistake there because I could not rub out any of the any of the lines. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh well. Um, uh, yes, as you've just seen on the thing, don't worry if you've missed some of the steps, as I know that probably felt a little bit quick. Um, you, you'll be seeing the images of the different steps as Isla and I have a chat, but are we ready to reveal? <laughs> One, <Yeah>. two, three. <laughs> I don't know, can you see that? Well, that looks great. How come you don't have any light like, eyes or anything in it? Mine looks quite scary. Well, it's so good. Mine also looks- Mine is, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a bit worried about the eye. Much. I find that quite disturbing. Um, <laughs> I might... <laughs> yes. It do um, look a bit so like that, though. I, I was seeing the, the square and the ovals, even though they would have been really helpful because I couldn't rub them out. So I just went. Yeah, it's really, it's a really helpful way of breaking down the, the big shape. And I mean, obviously, these sharks are massive, but how big can they get in real life? Is there a sort of a record that you know of? Or? How many meters or are they the size of a bus or yeah so average um they're about seven to eight meters long so that's about kind of like Whoa. the the size of a bus so they're, they're they're pretty big um but the largest mm -hmm. on record was 12.2 meters in length and that was found in canada wow. um and the interesting thing about the baskin shark is that they're kind of just recovering um so we used to fish them really really heavily in uk waters um, and we think mm -hmm. the population is only just recovering from that and they're really long lived. So the individuals that we're actually seeing mm -hmm. now are probably not fully grown. Um, so yeah, they can be they can be pretty enormous. So if you imagine that the average humans may be about between one and two meters in height, um, that's about eight people stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is your dad. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, that's my dad. My dad. Um, <laughs> incognito. Now, um, we must talk about the peanuts, as, as Lauren called them, the, the the shapes within almost, they almost look like a rib cage within the basking shark's mouth. Is this an adaptation to help? Oh, there we go. That's really helpful. Is there an adaptation? Is this an adaptation to help them feed in the water? Or, or why are they shaped like that? It is, yes. So bass sharks are actually filter feeding. So believe it or not, all the largest species of shark in the world, so there's three, um, they are all filter feeding species of shark. So they're not kind of like the great white shark that go out and actively hunt an animal. So basically what they do is they swim forward in the water with their mouth wide open. And those white mm -hmm. bands that you see inside the mouth there, they're called gill rakers, and they actually act like a giant sieve. So what they do is they catch all of the little, tiny little, little plankton in the water. So you can kind of see the plankton mm -hmm. in the water there and these little white yeah. specks. Um, and they're absolutely tiny. So the, the type that the Baskin shark eats are typically only about one to two millimeters in size. Um, and so mm -hmm. what those gill rakers do is it catches all of the plankton from the water and then they push all of the seawater out of their gills. Um, and then swallow all of that yummy, tasty plankton. Um, so that's what those kind of little, the little peanut shaped white bands are inside the Baskin shark's mouth. And I've actually got a video of a Baskin shark feeding that shows this perfectly. So if you can pop the video on, please. Yeah, so here we go. You can see the Baskin shark coming towards us. He opens his mouth really, really, really wide and you can see him pushing oh. through the water. Um, they are passive filter feeders, so the whale shark, which is actually the largest species of shark in the world, that's an active filter feeder, so they can suck the water in, whereas the basket 
and shark can't quite do that. And um, so they have to use the, the currents of the water and they have to use the tides to really push that through the mouth. Wow. Um, but just a fun fact here, um, they can filter about one million litres of seawater per hour. Um, so that's the equivalent per hour. of the hour, yeah. So you know that that's the equivalent of you know those big litre bottles of coke of drinking about a million of those every hour. <laughs> Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's, that's astonishing. And um, we've got a question from Robin Hutchinson, who's mm -hmm. asked, do basking sharks migrate to find krill or can you see them in the UK all year? That's a brilliant question. So that's actually why they're here. Um, so you can't see them all year round. So they arrive in the UK around now, actually. So you tend to see them from between May to September. Uh, but the season is from July at the end of August. Um, and the re reason they come here is because at this time of year, something really magical happens in the sea. Uh, so you get nutrients brought up from the bottom of the ocean and that comes up to the surface and they all, almost act as fertilizer. And you get a big blue plankton bloom of lots of little tiny organisms that they aren't quite plants, but they do do the same things to make the energy from um, so you get phytoplankton blooms and then that's followed by zooplankton blooms, basically tiny little animals that eat them. And that is what the Baskin shark feeds on. And so that's what brings them to our waters every single summer. And then after then, this is the amazing thing about the Baskin shark. We don't actually know what they do. And um, so they know that they migrate thousands of kilometers. So they, they've been found in uh, in the Azores, you know, they've been found as far as South America. And some of them actually hang around our waters too. Um, and then they just come up to the surface every summer. So over winter, they go really, really deep. So they go about a thousand meters deep. Um, wow. But we don't, we don't know why. We don't know what they go down so there for. serious, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they're, oh, they're wow. pretty, a lot of their life is absolutely shrouded in mystery. Yeah, I kind of love that about them though. Yes, me too, me too. <laughs> um, we had another question, which is an important one as well, um, from William Walton, I think, who's asked, are basking sharks affected by plastics in the oceans? Mm -hmm. So that's a really good question. And it's something we don't actually have a, a proven scientific answer to. Um, but something that we do with Baskin Shark Scotland is we, fill, we look at plankton samples. So we have tested how big the, the type of plankton is that the Baskin shark eat typically. Um, and we have found that they can be the same size as microplastics. Um, so you can maybe guess that there's a possibility the Baskin shark are filtering particles of pl uh, plastic out of the ocean. Um, but we haven't scientifically proven this. Um, so we definitely need more research into that. Um, and kind of more research into how that affects the animal. But but microplastics are a huge problem throughout the ocean. So, mm. you, you know, they, they are affecting all species. Um, so it would make sense that the Baskin shark is possibly filtering out microplastics in the seawater. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. Well, Isla, that was so interesting. And um, what are you going to do? Are you going to tinker away on your drawing and colour it in and pop it up on the wall for all to see? Yes. I'm <laughs> the go actually <laughs> and use something nice on the sharpie definitely definitely yeah. shape this oh i think it looked great oh well thank you so much for um for talk talking to us about sharks and make sure that you follow isla on social media and i think she'll probably be doing lots of sharky things over the summer as the season's just starting so um yeah make sure you check her out but thank you so much and have a lovely rest of your sunday thank you for having me Oh, you're welcome. See you soon. Okay, now we have our third ecologist who is studying ecology in a completely different realm. Um, Aileen Baird is, an, is a mycologist, sorry, and she studies fungi. She's a final year PhD student working on fungal ecology at the Birmingham Institute of Forest Research, which sounds pretty awesome. Aileen's research focuses on changing fungal populations in forests under increased concentrations of carbon dioxide. 
She's also highly engaged in outreach, working particularly in primary and secondary schools in addition to teaching university students. Aileen, welcome to the Big Ecology Draw Along. How are you doing? Hello, nice to see you. I'm hoping you can't hear the, the rain is just pouring against my window oh, here in Birmingham, so, um, so it's very yeah, miserable. Yeah, it's the same here. It's not very summery, is it? Now, um, how have you found uh, the Draw Along so far? Have you had any attempts of the shark or the bee orchid? It's been good. Yeah, let me show you the, um, the orchid. I managed to put a few... A few Few bits of colour on the on the orchid. Oh, and the, very and nice. Bee as bee. well. So I might see how my um, how my fungus <laughs> goes. Yeah, it'll, it'll and, not be too terrible. And do you enjoy drawing? Do you do much? I guess you know with things like mycology and ecology in general, there is a, a drawing element to scientific research, which is always quite useful. Do you? Yeah, I mean, more? I think no. I, it's not something that I do often, but I certainly I think it's helpful when you're trying to learn how to identify things or figure out what things are it's useful to when you're trying to I guess identify something and look at its features to be able to draw it I find that quite helpful but I'm definitely not an yeah. artist <laughs> yeah oh well it's always it's just the kind of trying it that that counts really and as you say it often can help you just piece together a lot of problems or misunderstandings on a species if you just sort of draw it out um, exactly and with fungi then, a lot of us, me included, associate fungal season as, as kind of autumn and winter and, you know, uh, being in the woods when the leaves are falling off and everything's decomposing. Is that right? Or are, are there fungi that we can be looking out for at the moment during the summer or what's kind of going on in the fungi world at the moment? Yeah, I mean, you're you're right in thinking that most, most fungi in the UK are um, fruiting, so producing their their mushrooms, their fruiting bodies in kind of autumn. That's kind of the typical time. But there are fungi that are fruiting at other times of year. So, uh, for example, one fungus that's that fruits this kind of summertime is the chicken of the woods, um, which is a kind of bright <laughs> yellow. Your names. I know they have amazing <laughs> names, don't they, fungi? So yeah, it's a, a bright um, orangey, yellowy fungus that grows on on trees and it's called chicken of the woods um, because it tastes of chicken so that's actually an edible fungus and so um, that's wow. one of the ones that you might see at this time of year it usually grows quite high up on trees and so you know like 10-15 meters up um, on the trunk so that's yeah. that's one to kind of keep an eye out for that's quite common at, um, at yeah. this time of year. Nice and um, with uh, an area of study like uh, mycology it's not that well well certainly at schools and things it's not that well promoted in terms of a really fascinating area of the natural world to be looking into what would you recommend for someone who might be interested in in studying um fungi and mycology i, th I think my, my main recommendation would be to try and find your local mycology group so there's lots of same as there is with lots of other kind of ecological disciplines um within mycology so they're usually linked in with the British Mycological Society um, but there'll be a group of like-minded people in your area that quite often at, usually in the autumn but other times a year as well will go out on walks and look for fungi and it's a, it's a really good way to connect with people in your area um, and people who have the expertise mm. and just to get outside and start learning about them and so I think that's the the main tip I would have because there are um, there are lots of people out there um, who are interested in fungi and love to talk about them. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's an amazing thing to learn about. And I think when you, you don't have to delve very far into the subject to realise how much of life that we know and we see is underpinned by fungi and fungal connections and things under the soil and between forests and things like that. It's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. It is it's it is mad to me that it's something that we don't really learn about much, um, you know, in science at school or anything like that. And I think it's something that everybody should be um, learning about a little bit more, at least, because I yeah. think it's, it's super fascinating. Yeah, totally. Well, before we move on to um, Hannah and her tutorial, let's have a look at what we're going to be drawing for our final drawing. Now, this is no chicken of the woods, but it's another amazingly named fungi called the octopus stinkhorn. And first thoughts are that it does just look like an octopus has got stuck in a rock head first or in the soil <laughs> yeah so yeah so it's growing it's growing from the soil um so yeah so this is aptly named octopus stinkhorn um because yeah it's got these kind of tentacles um the other name for it is um devil's fingers um so it's got you know these kind of right. big red um tentacles and you can kind of see in these pictures they've got this black goo on the tentacles um and that's really um, stinky so that's where the stinkhorn names come from and that attracts the flies that you can see on the surface of it and that's how um, 
that's how it spreads the spores so all of the that black goo is full of spores which is how the fungus reproduces and yeah they smell horrendous they smell like (laughs) like rotting meat um and manure they're you know you'll smell them before you see them yeah (laughs) oh good well let's um let's uh introduce our third artist then so hannah ayub um is an events producer she's an illustrator and science communicator who studied zoology at university and still gets to spend a lot of time drawing and talking about weird and wonderful animals and she regularly organizes workshops and events for science communicators and she speaks at science festivals and works on illustrations for various different science projects and she's going to come on and teach us how to draw that fantastic octopus stink Let's have a look. Hello everyone. So today we are going to be drawing the octopus stink horn. I am using two pens, a black pen and a red pen. Now if you only have one colour or if black and red don't contrast very well for you, that is absolutely fine. You can just draw in black, you can draw in any colour you want really. Um, But the first thing we are going to do is that we're going to draw three boxes on our page, like so. And then in this first box, we are going to draw a circle. Once we've got our circle, we're going to add two curved lines, like so, and that is the egg stage. In the second box, we are now going to draw two thirds of a circle down near the bottom here, like that. Then we're going to add two more curved lines to this, so it almost looks like it's opening up. Then once we've done that, we're going to take that red pen and draw in a pointy red arm that's coming out of there. And then once we've done that, we're going to add another about four arms to this two. We'll go for five there we go like that then once you've got your arms we're going to add some black shading down some of these arms just using short black lines like that And that is the second stage with the arms emerging. So we're going to move on to our third stage. And here we're going to do two vertical lines, curving sort of in towards each other slightly, like that. And I'm going to do a line across the top that connects them. And then some horizontal lines all the way down, like that. Then we're going to add two circles around the base of that sort of stalk shape. So we end up with this. Then we're going to switch back to our red pen and we're going to add a red arm again. But this time sort of they're going to curve away from that stalk. So we've got one arm, then we're going to add another four. we have five total and then once you've done that we'll switch back to our black and add some of the some black patches onto the arms like so just, just sort of like scribbling them in a little bit And there we have it, the three stages. Right. Um, <laughs> I didn't have a red pen, I had a pink highlighter. 
So it looks quite um, bright, but get the idea. I might redo. But shall we reveal on three? Yeah. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three. Oh, yours are so neat. <laughs> I managed to find a red pen, which definitely helped. Yeah. Oh, and so before we get into it then, just to clarify, these black scribbles that we drew on the third one, these bits here, yeah. is that the uh, spores that you were talking about, the sticky black stuff? that Exactly. So it's like this is thick black goo, and that's the bit that's, that's stinky. So when it's in this, mm -hmm. um, this egg stage at the beginning here, it doesn't really smell at all. Um, and so it, it does really do, it, it looks like an egg. So they're maybe three or four centimetres, these little white balls that you'd see off the, uh, the top of the soil. Um, yeah. And then as it, as it erupts from this egg and looks even more weird and alien-like, that's when it starts mm. to be smelly because that's when all of that black goo is on the outside of it and attracts all yeah. of the flies. And so the flies land on it, get all that sticky goo on their legs. And then when they fly around, mm. they, they spread, it, spread the spores around. That's amazing, isn't it? And why is it that um, they've, I mean, fungi is, is so bizarre, isn't it? And these fruiting bodies are so diverse. Why is the octopus stinkhorn, for example, why does it have to look like it's got tentacles? Do you think it's just an adaptation um, to cover I mean, a large think, surface area or? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's got that large surface area. It's, it's, it's brightly colored um, and so that, it you know it looks unusual i think the the smell is the main thing that's that that's mm. you know clearly evolved to attract the flies and other insects um because that's that's how it reproduces so other other fungi spread their spores in different ways um but yeah the the, the stinky stinkhorns are the ones that have this you know this goo so there's there's other different species of stinkhorns that look slightly differently but in common they all okay. have that, that um smelly goo on the surface to yeah so, that and, spreads and the how spores how many different species of stinkhorn fungus are there in in the uk there's several so the 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 octopus stinkhorn is actually one of the um the rarer ones so it actually was originally um from australia and it it spread to oh. the to the uk during the first world war when there was lots of an uh, international travel then so it's relatively rare you only really find it um kind of in the south of the uk um but there's okay. there's other um there's other different species of stinkhorn that are quite common. And so if you're if you're out looking for fungi in the forest um, and you do smell something that smells really terrible, there probably is a stinkhorn <laughs> nearby. You definitely smell them before you see them. Oh, amazing. And um, we've got a question here from a member of the audience. Is the octopus stinkhorn poisonous? So can you eat it? Because we know that there are some fungi that you can eat and some that you should steer well clear of. Um, so as far as I know, you can eat the octopus stinkhorn, but you really wouldn't want to. <laughs> um, based on, you know, from what I've said about how it smells, it really does smell of like rotting meat and like manure and just generally, I, I can't imagine anybody <laughs> smelling this and then wanting to eat it. So I wouldn't recommend, <laughs> not advised. Yeah. And um, I was just wondering, so we've, we've done all three stages of, of egg and then fruiting and spreading its balls. How What's the timeline here? How long does it take to get from point A to point C? Quite quick. Um, so most fungi, when they're, they're growing these, um, the fruiting bodies, so the, the mushrooms, as a lot of people call them, um, they're normally quite quick. So usually if you if you do find a stink corn that's kind of in this egg form, within 24 hours, it's probably... Um, hatched so erupted from the top um, and mm -hmm. then it might even be gone so that's it's um, if you do see them it's quite um, it's quite unusual to see the various um, stages but yeah it's quite quite speedy yeah yeah and um, what is it that, that got you into studying fungi above all the other things in the natural world what is it about them that drew you to them um, so I did a I did a project in my undergraduate degree. I did a, a project working actually in medical mycology, so looking at fungal diseases oh, wow. in humans. Um, and so I found that really interesting. And then it was one of those where, as I started learning more about um, you know the world of fungi and all of the different things, it just it became a really fascinating topic to me, and particularly one that you know you don't hear that much about it. You know, I never learned about it in school. I only really yeah. started learning about it towards the end of my um, undergraduate degree. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and then when the
the kind of opportunity came up to see it more within my PhD, within this this kind of um, ecology focus. Um, yeah, so it's be, it's become a real interest, but it's definitely something that I've become more interested in later, just because I, you know, I didn't I didn't know about it at school. I kind of I yeah, yeah. wouldn't have really considered fungi at all. Yeah. And um, do you have a, a favourite species? See, everybody always asks this question. It's really difficult. So I, I like a lot of the um, the brightly coloured fungi because I think, you know, it, it kind mm -hmm. of, um, you know, it shows that not all fungi are just, you know, these little brown mushrooms. Um, yeah. So one of the ones that I really like that's quite common um, earlier on in the year is the um, Scarlet Elf Cup. And so this is another one with a great name. So these little yeah. tiny cups, bright red. Um, and so yes. one of the, you know, the folklore around them is that they, you know, they fill with rainwater and so elves and fairies mm. would drink from them um, and so those are um yeah really cool and really um brightly colored um mm -hmm. and nice and so if we can get it up on on screen there's a like a collage of some of the other kind of different kinds of fungi that are i guess more common than the oh, octopus wow. stinkhorn so yeah these are all different um species that i found so the the fungi are really diverse you can see some of them in the the top left here you can see rather than having the kind of gills underneath like you would see mm. from mushrooms that you find in the supermarket they've got little tiny pores so they've got holes instead okay. um all different kind of sizes colors shapes um one of the ones in the middle you can see it's it's a fungus growing on a fungus so it's got kind of white mold on the top oh, of it yeah. so there's actually two fungi there one growing on the other um so they're a really mm. diverse kingdom and particularly in the autumn in the uk once you start mm -hmm. noticing them um you can't you can't unnotice them if you go for a walk um i mean mm. to be honest for the rain that we've been having i imagine there will be quite a lot of things <laughs> next next week yeah. around in the uk that will be um okay. that will be fruiting making the most of it and yeah. is it right that when you see a mushroom that's just almost like the tip of the iceberg and underneath you've got this immense network of mycelium all these lovely, lovely fine hair like um almost root structures really that just put feelers out and explore the forest floor and absolutely um so i kind of quite often use this analogy so so fungi aren't plants they're a different kingdom but if you if they were plants it would be like the the actual mushroom is like the flower in a plant so it's the thing that the fungus is using to reproduce so you're absolutely right underneath the um, the soil or if it's growing on deadwood through the deadwood there's this network of and they do look like roots just just a bit finer um so yeah mycelium that make this big kind of interlocking network and that's most of the most of the fungus and that's the kind of the main part of it and it's just producing those um mushrooms the fruiting bodies when when it wants to reproduce and so that's when it's producing mm. the the spores um, oh, wow what have we got here so this is another fungus that doesn't look like a, a mushroom um and so we're getting lots of different ones here of different types. So this is just kind of showing you that we get real um, diversity of sizes um, mm. of, and shapes of, of, of different fungi. So these are, these are all fungi that, that I've found. Um, that one there, you can kind of see the, the mycelium underneath it that are kind of growing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's tiny little one. Yeah, so they could, they're really variable in size, you know, from yeah. less, than a, less than a centimetre down to millimetres to much um, mm larger but i think it's just nice to show people that fungi are not just these little you know little brown blobs that they can be really colorful um really mm. beautiful i think and we have a lot of diversity in the uk um and it's a really yeah. a really interesting area of of ecology i think anyway mm. i'm obviously a bit biased yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no well i think um i'm i'm all for um you know learning a bit more about the things right at our feet and i think that uh, certainly something like fungi I hope that you know people like you that more and more people will um, start to take notice of them and, and start learning about them because they really are some of the most. I mean, if you want to have your mind boggled, learn a little bit about fungi, and it really is astonishing what they do. Um, okay, so I think unfortunately that went very quickly, and <laughs> that brings us to the end of the um, big draw along. And, um, you know, thank you so, so much, and Aileen, for your thank you. it's interesting been great. facts and your amazing research. And, um, yeah, please do, everyone, share your drawings with us and use the hashtag DrawAlongBES and EddieSciFest, as this is part of the Edinburgh Science Festival. And, um, yeah, let us know how you got on. Feel free to add some colour and some bees and some forest floor to your drawings and some ocean stuff for the basking sharks. And um, yeah, thank you so much for spending your Sunday morning with us and we hope you had a good time and see you soon.